Okay. Uh, I will share my screen and begin. Or try to here. Where is it? Hey, can everyone see my screen? Nope. Okay. How about now? Okay, perfect. Yeah. So uh, just, my name is Ryan Campbell. I'm on the board of Fair Vote Canada and Fair Vote Vancouver. I'm uh, presenting from the traditional unceded territories of the Squamish, tsleil and Musqueam First Nations. And uh, yeah, today we're gonna be talking about municipal uh, pro rep and municipal electoral reform. So it's just an overview just the introduction we did now, and then uh, talk about the problems with uh, the systems we're using in Canada. Uh, there's two real systems we use, but both can be called first past the post. So we'll just call them first past the post. Um, go over the some of the alternative systems, what we need in place to actually use those systems, and then describe the systems more in detail, uh, just so people can see what the alternatives are out there. So, you know, traditionally we think of proportional representation in terms of parties, right? Like what percentage of the vote party gets and what percentage of the seats they get? Is it, you know, 20% of the vote get 20% of the seats? And the thing about uh, municipal elections is they don't always have parties. You know, some places like Vancouver and Surrey and, and Montreal uh, have parties, but even in those uh, provinces that allow municipal parties, a lot of the cities just don't have them because people don't run on them and they don't vote for them. Uh, so, uh, and the parties can be a little bit weaker, a little bit more transient coming and going. And uh, so, yeah, how do how does pro rep work without parties? And so we need to start thinking about it in terms of, you know, break it down. What is a party? It's it's a label for voters to understand a group of candidates and, and a group of issues and, and perspectives and backgrounds. So that's what we're really getting at those without the label those issues you know are you pro housing development or against it are you you know pro bike lanes or against them uh, those are still there and and as are all the other myriad of issues that people will decide their vote on and we still want how people vote and and what their desires are to be reflected in in what the results are it's just a little bit harder to measure as all because you know, party results are very visible and, and you have to go into the details to find out, you know, where each person stands who gets elected and, and how people voted accordingly. But some of the problems with uh, first past the post in municipal elections, it's really the same problems we have uh, provincially and federally, right? That not uh, about half of people don't get uh, anyone they voted for elected. It was 42% in Mississauga. Uh, 64% in 2018. I don't have the numbers. Uh, that's half of votes. In, in Vancouver, you get multiple votes. So, you know, maybe a higher number of that actually helped elect someone. But uh, in general, it's not reflective of how people voted because half or more of votes aren't even counted in the results. Um, they also don't reflect how people voted in other ways that, uh, for example, visible minority candidates, 36%. People voted for visible minority candidates in uh, Vancouver in 2018, and only uh, 10, uh, one out of the 10 candidates elected was of, of a visible minority background. Uh, so that's a very clear case where the the kind of the math, the geeky the geeky part of the voting system there, is is directly discriminating against people and not giving people what they actually voted for. There was plenty of visible minority candidates running; they got plenty of votes but they weren't able to pool their votes and, and coalesce around candidates and get them elected. Uh, right of center candidates also, there's there's political skew as well. So in Vancouver, 48% of votes, I should say 2022, 48% uh, of votes uh, were cast for right of center candidates in 2022, and they got 70% of the seats. Uh, that's actually a bit unusual for Vancouver, and usually it's the left that... Uh, you know, is is more dominant and overrepresented, but the last two elections, it's been the right. 
uh, that's been overrepresented. So it shows that, you know, even if you expect first past the post to to benefit one side of the spectrum or not, you know, in the long term, it, it, it hurts everyone at some point. Um, there could also be high barriers to entry under first past the post. Uh, in a provincial or federal election, we would look at that as, you know, new parties, the Greens, for example, trying to break into in, in or or any other new party really trying to trying to break into the uh, the political scene is quite difficult and takes quite a bit of time. Like you see Quebec, which has the most ex successful example of that is the CAQ, but um, you know, they, they, their predecessor, the ADQ, was struggling for 20 years under first past the post with very few seats and, and until they finally broke through. Um, and so in, in the municipal context, we can we can see that in incumbents getting reelected, the same people getting reelected over and over. Uh, so 80% in Ontario was the average uh, in 2022. Uh, I I haven't crunched the numbers yet for um, for British Columbia for our municipal elections this year, but it, I believe it was eighty five percent in uh, in twenty eighteen, and uh, it was ninety four point two percent in Toronto. So it kind of goes to show if you if you get elected under these municipal nonpartisan elections, there's a real advantage to being an incumbent that that I think is unhealthy like unhealthily high. Uh, you have to really screw up badly to not get reelected in a place like Toronto in, in your ward, uh, which there was one candidate who that happened to this time. I won't name names, but uh, yeah, it's not, not fun to be that person at least, but uh, yeah. And an example of, of also this skew here, we look at, uh, this is the city council from Mississauga. Mississauga is 57% uh, visible minority. Council is, uh, how many people are we here? Two, four, six. So out of um, 12 people, there's two visible minority uh, people on council, uh, which is not uh, not amazing, not amazing representation. Um, so picking on Mississauga a little bit here, but uh, they were they were an example that sprung to mind of, of this kind of skew. And, as I mentioned before, Vancouver has this kind of ethnic skew as well within our council. It's a 20% visible minority, Vancouver's council, uh, compared to a population that's 50 or 55% uh, uh, visible minority. So it's quite stark as well. So what kind of systems uh, could we talk about here? So there's there's proportional representation. We talk about like the kind of traditional systems here, the three the main ones we talk about or that are most common internationally, uh, particularly open list pro rep, there's also closed list pro rep. Um, they're the most common systems internationally. Uh, mixed member proportional and single transferable vote. And we talked about these at other levels of of uh, government. There's really no reason they can't work at uh, at a municipal level as well. Um, the one caveat being uh, for these two systems here, if you if everyone runs as an independent, you don't actually necessarily have to have parties for any of any of these systems right people can choose to all run as independents if everyone runs in an, as an independent under a list system whether it's mixed member or plain list system um, it kind of degenerates into a single trans single non-transferable vote because every party is a party of one then um, so we'll go over these in these four systems here in more detail though so as i think that's kind of more relevant in most of canada where most of Canada right now, political parties uh, outside of BC and Quebec, political parties are banned municipally. And I don't think that's a good thing, but it's a thing and, and uh, an additional barrier to us that I don't think we strategically necessarily want to, to fight in order to get fairer systems at this time. So the prerequisites to get a proportional or semi-proportional system adopted are we need legislation at the provincial level. Uh, municipalities are governed by provincial legislation. And we need the provinces to actually allow it. And, and right now, the, they generally don't. Uh, I haven't done a review of every single province, but I know for a fact BC and Ontario uh, ban all proportional voting systems. Uh, that wasn't true uh, a couple of years ago, but uh, in Ontario, you could use single uh, transferable vote as an option, as well as you could use a rank ballot in single winner wards, which is not a proportional system. But it was an option, um, and Doug Ford repealed that legislation. So right now, all the parties, except for, uh, or at least all the parties represented in the provincial parliament, except for the conservatives, support having this kind of legislation. 
um, but it's not in place because the one that has a majority doesn't support. The other thing you need is multi-winner elections. You need to be electing multiple people together. So if you have a single member ward, like in Toronto or like in um, Ottawa, for example, uh, you don't, uh, you, there's there's no such thing as a proportional system that's exclusively single member wards. You need to have some multi winner component to it. Um, so that can be a tough fight in places, but there's a surprising number of parts of Canada where, where you already have multi member wards too, uh, which maybe they're good strategic options for us, like Guelph, Ontario, for example, has two member wards. We were quite active uh, fighting uh, the, there was a, an attempt to change those wards to single member wards and uh, and we fought back on that, and and luckily we had the populace on our side that they surveyed the population, and they said they like two member wards, so they kept two member wards. So that's still a, a strategic option for us. Same with uh, Vancouver, we elect uh, all ten of our councillors in one giant uh, constituency. You can, you can say. Um, same with all the municipalities in British Columbia, except for Lake Country, which is a mixed system, which is still a good target. It could be mixed member proportional there. So first option, we talk about a single transferable vote. I don't want to get too much into the weeds on this. Um, I can post to the chat our, we have a, a uh, if you just search in YouTube, Fair Vote Canada, single transferable vote, we have a video explaining it already. Um, but the idea is you rank as many candidates as you choose. Any candidate that has a quota, so it's like a, uh, a threshold to, to get elected. Anyone who has a quota gets elected. If you have too many votes, more than a quota, um, those extra votes get redistributed to your next choice. And if you have too few votes, you get eliminated. If you're the last place candidate and there's still seats to be filled, um, the, your next preferences get distributed accordingly as well. Um, if it's hard to wrap your head around that, that that's okay. Uh, like I said, we've got another video on that specifically. Um, yeah, and I'll just show you a ballot here. This is from Scotland, it's a sample ballot that their electoral officer in Scotland uh, was kind enough to send to me. And uh, just, you know, you can see, you could be an independent there. They could all be independents. In fact, in some Scottish municipalities, everyone is an independent, not because it's forced on them, but because they just chose to vote for independence. As you can see, it's used in Scotland, it's in Ireland, uh, New Zealand, in some places, it's growing there actually quite a bit. It's used across the board for their health boards. They have elected health boards. Uh, Australia in maybe half the states. The USA in some uh, cities, uh, Portland, Oregon, uh, just recently adopted it in the most recent uh, election, the midterm elections, they voted for it. Um, I think about 58% yes. Um, and uh, Malta, which uh, a bit of an anecdote now. <laughs> but you can see that the, this kind of, uh, um, in the Commonwealth, at least it, it's it's or in the 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 uh, the Kansas region region, it's it's more more common, uh, at least. So next is limited vote. Um, so limited vote. So you can imagine you're electing three candidates, and you get two votes, or you're electing four candidates and you get two votes. So the key is you get fewer votes than there are candidates to be elected, and in actual fact, this is effectively what we have in Vancouver. You get 10 votes in Vancouver. Um, effectively, people only typically use seven of them. So whoever's the biggest party or biggest block of votes tends to get seven seats then, and then three seats go to the opposition. Uh, so it's considered semi-proportional because that's not fully proportional, um, but it, it's it's better than, than, than strict uh, um, first past the post in that sense. Um, it's not used in a lot of places. Spain uses it for the Senate. Gibraltar uses it. Some places in the USA use it. They've had it imposed actually by courts there um, as a way to get away from first past the post. So that's uh, that's kind of the idea. Um, next is single non-transferable vote. You can look at it as a more extreme version of limited vote where you might have five, six candidates to be elected. You only get one vote. You only get to vote for one of them. Um, so generally, if you got, if you get elected under single non, a single transferable vote, that's kind of same quota is about, is roughly the same area where it'll guarantee you election. Same with um, any proportional system really. Uh, it, it's called, well, I won't even go into it, but the, the quotas are, are, are there kind of naturally. Um, and if everyone votes strategically, you get a proportional result. 
that's a big if though. Um, you know, you can't count on that. And the downside to single uh, non-transferable vote, it's used in Taiwan and Japan and, and a little bit more in East Asia. Um, and it was used for national elections at one point too, but it, it, the strategy kind of turned some people off there. So, but it's, it's very simple to understand, very simple to implement as well. And last one I want to talk about here is cumulative voting, uh, which is you get as many votes as there are candidates. So if there's four people in your award or whatever, you get four votes. But you can cast more than one vote for the same candidate, as many of those votes as you want. Um, so again, very simple to understand. It's used in the US. Um, it's also used in on corporate boards quite a bit. So the idea is that if you are a shareholder of a corporation, um, minority shareholders so want representation and some uh, some jurisdictions actually mandate the use of this to ensure minority shareholder rights are protected. So there's kind of an interesting that places will recognize the value of minority representation in corporations, but not recognize it in their other in their democracy at large. It's a little bit more than a little bit hypocritical. Um, but yeah, very simple, very easy to understand. Only challenges the ballot can be a bit large because you have you have to have space to put all those votes on, next to the same candidate. Um, cumulative voting is a little bit neat because there's really good research on it. So in the US, um, courts have imposed cumulative voting as a remedy to Voting Rights Act uh, violations. Um, and uh, they've uh, there's been some neat research on cities that have had this imposed on them and on uh, and some of them choose to maintain it even after the imposition is gone and on school boards as well and the school boards that are are elected by uh, cumulative voting uh, hire more visible minority teachers so it, i find that quite interesting that that the more representative system at the democratic level has impacts the hiring practice of the board itself um, because they're not directly hiring teachers, right? They're just setting the policies and they're they're choosing the very high level management. And city councils, it's, it's been shown similarly that uh, cumulative voting does a very good job, better than first past the post in wards, very, better than at large uh, first past the post, um, at electing, uh, at hiring a diverse police force, um, which can be important, right? That in, in terms of how you're policed. And I, I think it's a very clever measure here. Now, there's no reason to think these findings wouldn't apply to any other proportional system too. This is just the most common proportional or semi-proportional system in use in the United States. Well, that's why it's been researched there extensively. And I, but I think it's it's a good um, good feather in our cap and an argument for us to make is that, that if you want, um, kind of an inclusive uh, city government, uh, this is the proportional, semi-proportional system is the way to go. So uh, just a note on parties. So I mentioned this before, but uh, like an independent is really just a party of one. So systems that use parties don't have to exclude independents. Um, and there's cases of independents getting elected from the party list of one in places like Australia and places like Scotland. Um, you know, Scotland under MMP and parties only really have to be, you know, the bare sense of a party, like a, a vote pooling agreement. There isn't necessarily a party whip associated with them. There isn't party discipline even necessarily associated with them. Um, and I th I'm kind of making the case here why parties are a good thing to include, though, as an option at least, is because it gives uh, voters information about where people stand and where candidates stand. Um, now, I say that it's supposed to do that. In Vancouver, we had the unfortunate, and Surrey, to, to be honest, too. We Everyone ran on very generic names like Progress or One City or uh, or Forward or A Better City. Um, that doesn't really tell people much about where you stand. <laughs> it's just a vague, positive thing. And, and, Positive vibes is basically the rule of the day for the the parties in Surrey and in Burnaby and and all that too. But you know, as, as brands get established, it does at least give some information to voters and simplify their decision making. And the parties also tend to foster diversity. That they make more efforts to recruit um, candidates than than just unaccountable uh, power brokers would. So 
there you can see that uh, provincially and federally the, the NDP, for example, has put a lot of effort in recruiting diverse candidates uh, and uh, has good results on that as, as well. So a note on wards, uh, just mentioning before that you need multiple winners to have some kind of proportional results. So single member wards alone we view as a, ver as a barrier to electoral reform or meaningful electoral reform at least. Um, so if you have single member wards right now, that doesn't mean all hope is lost, but you would need to have uh, e either a willingness to merge wards, so you have two member wards, or to add seats, so the existing wards now elect two people or three people um, or so on, um, or you would need to add some kind of higher layer of, of of seats that are elected at, a, at multiple winners for a mixed member system or something like that. And just to spit a research here too, that single member wards, they also have what I view as a negative impact on policy. That might not be a view shared by everyone here, but um, depending on how you view housing uh, development, uh, that uh, the adoption of single member wards uh, really empowers the not in my backyard kind of mentality. Uh, which means a 40% drop in multifamily home development, and that's often the most affordable housing out there. Um, and it also means uh, a huge drop. And and, and they, the um, paper I found this in was more qualitative than quantitative, but they found that cities that adopted wards were more likely to ban uh, social housing entirely, uh, which is which is. You know, I think at least a, a big problem, especially with the housing crisis we have in our society here. So what can you actually do about this? Well, there's two things. Um, and I'll confess that we really are only organizing around this issue in Ontario and British Columbia, but we could organize it elsewhere as well, which is, you know, you can ask your provincial representative for enabling legislation um, for we call it local choice, and then ask your municipal politicians to support it as well. Um, and it's not the hardest ask because it's just an option, right? Uh, some places like Scotland, uh, what they did is their 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 national government there uh, just swooped in and forced everyone to adopt pro rep. Now I don't think that's going to happen here, unfortunately. So we're just asking for the option, and then we'll fight it case by case at the uh, the city level and, and the municipal level, and and have you know, a multitude of campaigns that way. And some will win and some will lose, but at least the, the dam will be broken and, and again, right? Uh, and that's something uh, something we think is valuable, or I think is valuable and, and spend a fair amount of time on. Um, and that's about it. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Hi, I have questions. Okay. Okay, my first question is, you said that, I think you said with, was it cumulative voting or single non-transferable? One of them you said that it's proportional if everybody votes strategically. And I wondered what exactly you meant by voting strategically. Uh, so that's true of both of them. So you, you could imagine uh, you, basically, if you had perfect information, like I have my candidates and they're going to get half the vote, then I know, say it's a party. Party A is going to get half the vote. There's six seats available. They're going to get half the vote. You need to divide your votes evenly between th three candidates to get half those seats elected. So if everyone does that perfectly, then you get perfectly proportional results. Reality is people aren't going to do that perfectly. So that's why it's called semi-proportional. It just it tends to be proportional over time. But there will be pluses and minuses each election because you know, someone gets too many votes, someone gets too few votes. Okay. Um, and you said uh, that parties can help with uh, help people determine who to vote for. Do you, has there been evidence that um, that municipal elections involving parties have higher turnout? I, I don't have good studies on that. I could take a look. I, I think it would be tough to find a good jurisdiction to compare though, because um, yeah, like maybe in British Columbia, you might might have some some view on that, but it's not. It's a really bad voting system too, so it's hard to separate those factors. What what there is evidence for is um, is that uh, Elections Canada has done studies on why people don't vote, 
number one issue for not voting is not knowing where the candidates stand. So they don't know what the liberals stand for, what the conservatives, New Democrats, Greens, what they stand for. They don't know who the leaders are. It's a lack of information. It's the number one reason people don't vote in this country. Now, we now feeling your vote doesn't count is also a, a major issue too, but the, the number one issue for people not voting um, at a federal level, at least, is lack of information. Okay, and you mentioned a study um, showing that single member wards tend to lead to uh, less approval of multi-family homes. Um, can you provide a link to that? Yeah, I'll, I'll dig that up and I'll send it to you directly. Okay, thanks, Ryan. Thanks. Uh, Constance, I see you have your hand up. Hi there, I wanna go back to um, cumulative voting mm -hmm. as well. Um, here on the West Shore, um, near uh, Victoria, BC, we like to call it QVO to make it easy to remember, cumulative voting, QVO. Um, one of the images that I have of that, I don't think you said, and I'm wondering what you think about it. Um, each voter has the same number of votes as are, as the seats that are available, correct? Correct. And the thing about cumulative voting is you can put all of those votes onto one candidate or you can divide them up as you see fit. And one of the ways in which I could see cumulative voting resulting in more diversity um, would be in the event that there is a particular candidate who um, represents a particular community or a particular point of view that has not been well represented on, on the council um, before that election. And that particular candidate has enough supporters who put all of their votes on that one candidate. Um, so then you might have a more diverse result um, because of that effect. Now, um, I'd, I'd be interested in, in your comment about using Cubo in that way and any other comments that other people on this uh, webinar would so it, it, it absolutely does that. That's the way it's worked in practice in, uh, in, in the U.S., uh, that these historically underrepresented communities have been able to pool their votes against, around one or more candidates. Because in, in the U.S., uh, so what we use in British Columbia, I call it first past the post, it's at large though. So I get 10 votes for 10 seats. If party A gets 51% of the votes, party A gets 100% of the seats. Um, so it's very disproportionate. And in the United States, historically, party A has been in a lot of places, party A has been white people and party B has been black people. And it has completely excluded black voters from office, even when they were numerically very significant. So the one thing I want to caution, I, I agree with your point completely, but uh, it might not just be one candidate, I guess is what I'm getting at. When when you're talking like excluding 45% of voters, the proportional share there, that could be four out of nine seats or something like that. Um, but they could pool uh, their votes very efficiently um, by forcing people to, so if you look here, I've got the, a, a, hopefully it shows so there's the um, a ballot of a, of a a uh, cumulative voting election. And the difference between what we have right now in BC is you have to spread those votes around. You can't put them all on one candidate. So you're forced to dilute your vote. That's what they call it in the US. And that forced vote dilution uh, very disadvantages minority groups. So you're absolutely correct. Uh, anyone else? I don't know if I, I'm seeing everyone here. Hi, Ryan. Yep. Thanks for doing this. Um, so I feel like I'm really stupid on this, but um, um, I don't really understand. Like, I know when we vote provincially and federally, we get one vote. And, and so, you know, I understand the injustice there. I don't really understand when you get, say, six votes um, for council, why it ends up being first past the post too. I, I, can you sort of shed some light on well, why, it, why it doesn't work? 
So I, I give you an example. I, I mentioned on the on the, the the party A versus party B, right? So if a certain slate of voters, it could be a party, it could be just the incumbents. It's quite frequently actually the incumbents. Um, if they get 51% of the vote, they will take every single seat. And so you completely exclude uh, er everyone else from representation. So that exclusion of minority viewpoints, that's that's exactly what first past the post does provincially and federally as well um it, it's also a little bit bizarre when you think about it because in addition to not being very representative it gives your sixth choice just as much weight as your first choice and i don't know about you but i don't feel as strongly about my sixth choice as my first choice um i so and you start you start voting for you might not know six candidates that you like right and uh so you start voting on on silly things and i'll give an example of that is my dad voted for you know my name's ryan campbell my dad's name is clark campbell there was a guy named uh oh i can't even remember his first name now but anyways there's another campbell running in delta my dad voted for him just because he liked his last name right and well what happens when everyone does that well they tend to vote for last names they like from their own ethnicity so the largest ethnic group, which is usually white people, gets an advantage from that as well, um, which is it's like for people sixth or 10th choices. Right? Um, so that's an additional level of bizarreness. Um, and another way to look at it is you're just doing a first past the post election six times, right? Like you get six mm -hmm. votes you, you, and that's the way it used to be done in BC. Uh, we used to have like more than one MP, uh, MLA for some writings like Vancouver Burrard. And you would have Vancouver Burrard A, Vancouver Burrard B, and you just Vancouver Burrard C or whatever, right? And you just do the same race over and over. This combines it all, but you get the same effect. It's the same people voting over and over. And so the same dominant group gets to dominate the council as well. And the dominant group might not even have half the votes though, right? You could be split in more ways. So it's, it's about giving your vote more precision Sure, and and not letting the majority's votes swamp out everyone else's votes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Just trying to scan through here. I hope that was helpful. <laughs> Oh, Don, you've got one. Yeah, well, um, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, cool. Well, I live in Toronto mm -hmm. and we don't have democracy anymore. So, you know, it's a, a long upward battle for us. And I'm just wondering if you have any recommendations uh, of where we begin. Well, I think, like I mentioned, it, earlier is that the provincial government controls, especially so in Toronto, where they set even the number of wards you can have, right? So you, you need a uh, either a change of opinion from the current government or a change of government. And that would be the starting the starting point. And the, the fortunate thing, though, I think you have is that the um, all the um, provincial parties, except for the Conservatives, do support giving Toronto the option to change. Um, so, you know, no government lasts forever, I guess, would be my point. Uh, do you think it would be worthwhile to uh, press our councillors? Um, we do have uh, some very progressive councillors, uh, even a balance. And I think that's why this strong legislation, mayor's legislation was brought in. Um, do you think we should uh, persuade them to... Um, uh, support uh, a citizens assembly for the city of Toronto? That's not a bad idea. So uh, Portland, I, I mentioned, just got um, a, uh, just got a proportional representation and they did it through what was called a charter commission. So they have a, mm -hmm. a charter city charter and their charter commission, which wasn't randomly selected actually. So it was, it's not a true citizens assembly, but it was independent of the council they went and studied a variety of issues and brought back a package of reforms of which uh, proportional representation was one of them. So I think um, I think the way Portland did it with political appointees 
I wouldn't recommend that, but if a citizen driven process like a citizens assembly, I think is a great idea, especially for Toronto, because Toronto, you know, as someone who lived in Toronto myself for, for seven years, like Toronto has some special issues in, in the sense that it's such a large city, but the, the government there has so little power. Um, but is responsible for delivering so many services for transportation, not just for the city itself, but for the right. whole region. <laughs> um, right. So, so I, I think you could you could sell that actually quite well, a citizens assembly, or or a citizens commission, or something like that, whatever you want to call right. it. Um, I think that's a good path forward, and it's a path, frankly, that that I'm going to try to explore with the the new council in Vancouver as well. Uh, and Great. it was. We had a, an, I'll mention too, we had a, a independent elections task force here in Vancouver, which recommended a, a citizens assembly. Now there's a high overlap between people on that task force and, uh, and, you know, had one of our past presidents on it of Fair Vote Canada, it had the president of Fair Voting BC on it. So a little bit of a, little bit of a <laughs> Homer group for us, but uh um, they, that's what they recommended as the path forward here too. Excellent, thank you. Um, I have another question. Sure. Um, who are the uh, opponents to this? And that's one question. And I guess the usual suspect, but you know, you answer that. And um, and what is the motivation for voters to change? Because I think there's clearly uh, clearly um, um, frustration at the federal and provincial level, but it's slightly less so at municipal. I mean, it already has fairly low voter turnout, except in a place like Langford, which did you know had made a major change, but usually it just kind of rolls over like a non-event. Yeah, good way to go, Langford. I, I think that's a, that's a, a challenge because people. Like you say, the turnout's so low. People have already voted with their feet, right? They voted not to vote, um, and that I think is troubling. So I, I think the the impetus should be how little engagement our democracy is getting, right? Like that you're talking. I think Oshawa or Peterborough, maybe Wolf can correct me here, but uh, one of them had like 15 percent turnout. Um, like, is that really a democracy anymore? When like eight out of nine people, or eight, seven out of eight people, or are not even showing up at the polls. Um, that's what I would I would I would put forward there. Um, the opponents uh, there was they had a radio debate on this actually when we brought it forward to Vancouver Council uh, last term, and uh, Bill Thielman was the opponent on it. Uh, so he ran the no side for three referendums on PR here. Uh, so it's the usual suspects. Um, some of the arguments that were made was it would be confusing to voters to have different electoral systems at different levels of government. Um, but, you know, Scotland has three different voting systems for three different levels of government. Their, their spoiled ballot rate's the same as ours. Uh, voters can handle it. And uh, same with the, uh, and, and, and like, in yeah, terms of- just want to eat. <laughs> um, mm. That was one argument. We actually did better than we expected though, that uh, it went to a vote of the Lower Mainland Local Government Association, and it failed on a tie. Uh, like there's about 200 councillors that can vote there. And so it voted like 100 to 100. We don't get a report of who those are, but there's actually, that's better than I expected at least. <laughs> um, another side of the opposition is just bureaucratic resistance. Um, we met with Nathan Cullen on this uh, when he was formerly now the minister responsible for municipal affairs in BC. And uh, he was more open to it, I would say. He didn't promise us anything, but he was more open to it than the bureaucrats that were with him, the deputy ministers. They're pretty conservative on, on this front too. So it's institutional inertia is an issue. Um, and there was a negative report written by the chief electoral officer of uh, Vancouver on this issue as well, that they were concerned that it would make the ballot more complicated. Vancouver already had like, we can get up to 70 candidates per council and then we have two other races you vote on so you ended up with like a hundred and something people on the ballot uh, and they were worried that that was that that would make that worse which i don't think it necessarily would and, and like again like like the dutch have like a thousand candidates and they do fine and they have much higher turnout than we do so clearly the number of candidates isn't what determines if people show up or not mm -hmm. um 
but also like in the Scottish don't have that many candidates on their ballots. They only have like maybe 10 candidates for three positions. It's not, it's, it's not necessarily even true what their accusations were. Um, but yeah, I don't know if, if you can find also like a disconnect in terms of viewpoints that are not being represented, uh, that can help too in, in Vancouver. Um, the parties that, so there was, a, there was a, something called the Vancouver plan, which would have, increase the amount of uh, multifamily development in across the city. Every candidate or every councillor that voted against it lost their reelection. And so that perspective, which is probably 30% of voters that, that didn't like it, um, that per perspective isn't on council at all. And I don't think, you know, I'm not one of those people, but I don't think that's healthy for democracy. Wolf, you had something? I was just wondering, why there isn't more activity on municipal government reform in the Vancouver, sorry, in the Victoria district, uh, the capital district. Um, if you look at the last federal election results, um, the NDP dropped 35% of the vote in those three capital district ridings, and the Greens 22%, 57%. Progressive, that's probably the most progressive large uh, district in BC, it seems that that would be the first place to try and get municipal reform. And I don't know if anything is happening in Victoria. I would say in terms of like areas that are friendly to reform, this map is pretty informative. I would say this is results in the 2018 referendum as well. So you can see like the, the Kootenai, Kootenai, West Kootenai's Nelson area is another hotspot for us. And then part of Vancouver, and uh, and then the capital region, um, but I think I think Anne's point is really explains it. Is people don't necessarily make the connection, and they're not as frustrated, or they just ignore it completely, right? They, they just don't show up to vote. Um, that would be the reason. But we, I mean, we can keep fighting that. Uh, I know Keith is working on that, and you know, is uh, you're on the island now too, I believe, right? Um, and there there's you know there's more activity there, I would say than. The vast majority of the rest of the country. <laughs> it's, um, yeah. Anyone else? I got to scroll through here to see if anyone pops up. Yeah, I tend to agree with what Gisela just put up um, uh, in the chat. Just disappeared. Uh, let me see. I think there's generally low awareness that PR even works at the municipal level. I think that's it. They just haven't, you know, we haven't heard much about it. And, um, oops, what am I doing? Um, so, yeah, so it's it's just not on people's radar. Yeah, like, Anita's probably going to say this in a second here. She's got her hand up too. But before she does, I would just say, like, I think that's something the purpose of this too is to make sure that our own people understand the connection because I don't think even our own people necessarily are that aware of how proportional representation could work at municipal level. So we need to do our own work internally here. Uh, Anita and then Keith. I just wanted to draw everybody's attention to the recent win in Portland. I know we've been talking about that, but in terms of how to get people, our, even our own people interested, it is a real slog. Um, but one thing that people grasp onto is just a win. So, I mean, if you look at, honestly, if you look at the successful campaigns for instant runoff voting, which we don't support, a big part of the reason that folks get into that is because, oh my God, it's a win. <laughs> it's a win. And so when you look at what happened in Portland for us, where PR won in a huge city, people would be so excited to see that here. You know, imagine a headline across Canada, uh, Vancouver, City of Vancouver adopts proportional representation and how that would affect our provincial and federal campaigns. So if you need th to use that as an in to get people into the conversation, I would suggest doing that. Yeah, and, and, and there was uh, a good example of that. About a hundred years ago was the first time ProRep was seriously pushed for in Canada. And there were cities after cities, particularly in Western Canada, adopting ProRep. Um, and all that kind of came to a crashing halt in the 1950s because 
when you elect uh, people proportionally, some of those people are on the left, heaven forbid. And there was the whole red scare going on then with like, oh my God, you know, the communists are coming for us and we can't have that. And and you look at some of the reasons for getting rid of uh, pro rep in, in some cities like New York, there were some pretty racist reasons too. So, you know, stuff that doesn't necessarily have the same traction today. But yeah, the, the idea that like one win could build into two wins could build into 10 wins. Definitely, there's definitely a precedent for that, uh, both in Canada and in the US. And Keith? Yeah, uh, coming back to the capital region in BC, uh, one of the struggles that we also find is that there are 13 different municipalities in the Victoria region. And so finding a good starting point, which, which municipality do we approach? Which ones are friendly? Well, we have 13 councils and mayors that, that we have to consider. And, you know, time is not always on our side when it, when it comes to this. Mm. Yeah, that's, I would say that's a problem for us in Vancouver too, is, is that we just, the volunteer resources is an issue, right? We need more people, more time, we, we do more. Um, so that is what it is. Anyone else? Oh, I see another hand. Where, where's the hand? Anita. Just one more thing I want to share with everybody that's been like a takeaway um, for me out of the stuff in Portland and and before this too is something I've been thinking about for a long time. Um, just how much easier it is sometimes to win PR when it's packaged with other things. So in when we talked to one of the main campaigners in Portland, uh, the Sightline Institute, they talked about that too. So they're with their charter commission. So think of that as like their citizens assembly, even though it wasn't chosen like a citizens assembly, it was citizens, okay? They put together a whole package of reforms and PR was packaged in there with that. So when they brought together a coalition of community groups across the city to run this campaign, there were groups that were extremely interested in some of the reforms and couldn't really give a hoot about proportional ranked choice voting. And then there were ones that were really into proportional ranked choice voting and the other stuff uh, was along for the ride. And that's part of, I think, what Ryan's getting at in terms of, you know, a charter commission or a citizens assembly in Vancouver is it would bring groups who have an interest in seeing thing, better government in your city together to campaign for something and that we would be part of. And it's a lot easier, I think, to knock on doors when you can connect your package of reforms to issues in the community that people care about and better governance on those issues than when you're standing at a door trying to explain municipal voting systems. So I think that's a takeaway for me is look at look beyond the usual suspects for who your um, allies might be in your community to do something that's broader than just voting systems. I see, oh, that's a clap, not a hand. Okay, is that someone trying to, Constance, are you trying to speak or are you just applauding? Okay, just applauding. Okay, yeah, I, I this, was, this was a big takeaway for me as well. Like from Portland, though, was was them packaging it, and I, I would keep I'll let people know too that Portland, this was their second charter commission. So they they had one, and it only had some minor reforms, and then they decided, oh, this was a good thing. We're going to do it every ten years, have a charter commission, and so just having that institution, um, like you could you could have a a, a charter commission kind of citizens assembly whatever in whatever city you are even without the enabling legislation just having that institution that place to go to that isn't a bunch of politicians was helpful because it, those people don't have the same conflict of interest that politicians do in saying hey i want to be king of king or queen of my ward forever um yeah it was actually yeah Gisela, you're clarifying that it's Portland, Oregon. Actually, both Portlands adopted proportional ranked choice voting this time. Portland, Maine, and Portland, Oregon both voted for it. Um, but yes, the Charter Commission was in Portland, Oregon. Anyone else? Anita, your hand's still up. I don't know if it's supposed to. I think that's it. Um, thank you everyone for coming out.
and uh, hopefully, hopefully folks will be at the other uh, more the seminar, I guess, tomorrow with uh, Dennis Pilon. And uh, yeah, thanks again. Thank you, Rob.